Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, well, final panel of what I think has been a very interesting and thought-provoking uh, conference so far. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to uh, introduce a panel on from raids to retrospection, assessment of strategic bombing. And uh, first up, we have my colleague, Dr. Alistair Noble from the Air Historical Branch. Uh, he's one of the official historians before joining the branch. He was a senior lecturer at Sandhurst. And um, before that, one of the historians at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And he'll be talking about hitting the heart of Prussian militarism, the RAF and the Potsdam Raid. Alistair. What was the point of Potsdam? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, in North London and beyond. Stuart, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Volume six of the Air Historical Branch's narrative, the RAF and the bombing offensive against Germany, concludes the chronological operational series. It takes the reader to the war's end in Europe. Various famed operations are recounted. The devastating attack on Berchtesgaden, the hammering of Heligoland, and the mana supply drops to starving Dutch civilians. The last significant main force attack by Bomber Command on a major German city is not mentioned. This long paper investigates the bombing of Potsdam by Bomber Command on the night of the 14th to the 15th April 1945. It attempts to set the strategic context for the operation before evaluating the aims, objectives and effectiveness of the attack. It touches on the impact on the ground. Initially, I favoured the title hitting the heart of Prussian militarism, Potsdam being the German army's historic home. However, I have instead taken a more critical look at the justification for this heavy raid so late in the war. Why, when Berlin was being menaced by all mosquito forces, did, Ber did Potsdam require a main force attack? Could it be justified? when even Churchill expressed his concerns days afterwards. At the outset, I must underline that the planners and the RAF in mid-April 1945 did not know that the war would end within four weeks. Nor should it be forgotten that the Third Reich's wheels of death rolled until the very end. The regime kept killing. The Potsdam operation has received more coverage in German than in British accounts. Not all German accounts were wholly accurate. Condemnation of the operation was led by the ideologically charged historical approach of the former German Democratic Republic. This portrayed the Western Allies and Nazi Germany as two sides of the same imperialist coin. Later, following German unification, the charge was led by the revisionist scholars, notably Jörg Friedrich, he alleged Potsdam was attacked because it symbolised Prussian militarism rather than as a military objective. Friedrich cited 5,000 deaths, more than those killed by bombing in Germany in 1940 and 1941 combined. Friedrich's fatality figure echoed East German estimates. Most authoritative accounts now suggest the number perishing in Potsdam was less than a third of this figure. 1,593, many possibly in uniform. The recently deceased local historian, Hans Werner Mihan, provided a more balanced, accurate account of the raid and its objectives in his 1997 study, Die Nacht von Potsdam. Indeed, the air war's impact is still felt in Potsdam. In June 2020, Potsdam experienced its largest evacuation when 13,600 residents were moved away from the city centre as the authorities made safe a 500-pound RAF bomb found in the River Havel, near the main railway station. Shortly afterwards, on the 15th of July this year, the 204th unexploded bomb found in the environs of Potsdam since German unification in 1990, an American 500-pounder this time, was made safe. So, setting the uh, Potsdam operation in a strategic context, the bombing of Potsdam by Bomber Command 
came two months after the Anglo-American attacks on Dresden. In the interim, Nazi Germany's military position became hopeless. The remit of the Reich was restricted to a narrowing strip of land, barely 120 miles wide in central Germany, the area between the rivers Elba and Oder. The Western Allies had stopped on the Elba despite British reservations. The Americans placated Uncle Joe and left Berlin to the Soviets. The Soviets had sat on the Oder 40 miles east of Berlin since the end of January. Bridgeheads were consolidated and supplies assembled. While the Nazi leadership remained in place, last ditch resistance was demanded from all Germans, young and old, in the remnants of the Reich. The boys of the Hitler Jugend and the old men of the Volkssturm were primed for the final fight. Draconian discipline held sway. Roman court marshals dispensed summary justice. Explosives were attached to bridges. Berlin's trams were filled with debris, a plentiful resource to form primitive barricades. President Roosevelt's death on the 12th of April was seized on by Nazi propagandists as divine intervention, signaling a turning for the tide and the collapse of the unnatural enemy coalition. Allied differences were real, but would not impede the short-term priority of defeating Nazism. From the 16th of April, Marshal Zhukov's first Belarusian front encountered intense German resistance when storming the Silau Heights on their advance to Berlin. Soviet casualties were then high in street fighting in the capital itself. There remained a sting in the German tail to the war's end. Despite years of setbacks and retreats, the German military remained a coherent force in April 1945, capable of maintaining prolonged disciplined resistance. It was an entity in defeat, but not yet conclusively defeated. From the perspective of German air defence, diminishing fighter numbers, fewer trained pilots, and an acute fuel shortage was compounded by weaker flak defences. Flak batteries were sent to the fronts to tackle tanks in December 1944 to the Ardennes and in late January 45 to the Oder to stem the Soviet surge. Large parts of Germany were stripped of flak air defence. 30 heavy and 13 light flak batteries were removed from the defences surrounding Berlin from the 23rd of January. Two weeks later, to release more men for the fighting fronts, searchlight units around Berlin were reportedly disbanded. Remaining flak batteries were critically short of ammunition. From the Allied perspective, at this point, the combined bomber offensive was laid down in the combined Chief of Staff Directive Optagon 29 of the 16th of September 1944. This stated the primary objectives were the progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic systems and direct support of land and naval forces. By early 1945, there were decidedly mixed messages from Downing Street about bombing German cities. The same Winston Churchill, who in late January demanded attacks on Germans retreating from Breslau, setting bomber command on a course towards Dresden, became critical of Harris's force and the nature of its operations. This was illustrated in Churchill's much quoted minute to the Chiefs of Staff of the 20th of March 1945, in which he said, it seems to me that the moment has come when the question of bombing German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though under, under other pretexts, should be reviewed. Otherwise, we shall come into control of an utterly ruined land. The destruction of Dresden remains a serious query against the con conduct of Allied bombing. I feel the need for more precise concentration upon military objectives rather than on mere acts of terror and wanton destruction, however impressive. A series of brutal raids and Churchill seeing the repercussions when he visited Montgomery on the Rhine on the 26th of March, led him to tell the Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Charles Portal, to focus on oil and transport. When Churchill's sentiments were conveyed to Sir Arthur Harris, they received a strident response. He believed the bombing of German industrial cities had fatally weakened their war effort. 
As a result, Allied armies were advancing into the centre of Germany with negligible casualties. Writing to, Sir no uh, writing to Norman Bottomley, the Vice Chief of the Air Staff, on the 29th of March about Churchill's critical minute, Harris echoed the former Prussian and German Iron Chancellor Otto von ba Bismarck's maxim. I do not personally regard the whole of the remaining cities of Germany as worth the bones of one British grenadier. A less abrasive Prime Ministerial Minute was issued on the 1st of April. Portal then advised fellow chiefs that attacks on industrial centres for the sake of destruction would now end. The air staff ordered the end of the area offensive, except when needed specifically to support the land and sea campaigns. Harris was told on the 6th of April. However, it was not watertight. Built up areas could still be attacked if this assisted the Allied armies with oil refineries, shipyards and marshalling yards bombed into May. When informed about the Potsdam operation, a frustrated Churchill asked the Secretary of State for air, Sir Archibald Sinclair, what was the point of going and blowing down Potsdam? Portal told Churchill that Harris had already been directed to cease industrial area attacks and signalled an order of the day on the 16th of April for circulation in Bomber Command and to share with the press. For the first time since February 1942, the directive contained no mention of industrial areas or enemy morale as dedicated objectives. But by then, Potsdam had already been bombed. A dozen days after the raid on Potsdam, the Red Army occupied the city, part of its wider operation to encircle and engulf Berlin. US and Soviet troops had already met at Torgau on the 25th of April, severing the Third Reich. Potsdam lay behind the Iron Curtain for 45 years. So why Potsdam? Potsdam was a key east-west rail hub, alongside its numerous barracks, support and training establishments. Here in April 1945, the last levy was being readied for the last battle. There were genuine military sites in Potsdam. Nevertheless, the bombers Baidecker of 1944 had not rated it as a target. Some 18 miles southwest of Berlin city centre, Potsdam had 126,000 inhabitants. It was described as the chief resident of the residence of the Hohenzollerns, which had developed into an important military centre with extensive barracks, garrisons mainly by household troops. Potsdam epitomised Potsdam epitomised Prussian militarism. The day of Potsdam in March 1933, shown on this slide, symbolised the fusion of the old Prussia and the new National Socialist Germany. Potsdam was believed to house many administrative and archival offices of the German and Prussian governments. It had no industries and was mainly residential, home to many retired military and governmental officials. The railway repair shops, with three and a half thousand workers dealing with all types of rolling stock, was the only location in Potsdam in the British document Economic Key Points in German Towns and Cities to be assigned a Priority 2 status. There were no top priority targets. Worryingly, from the German standpoint, there were also no major air raid sh shelter construction in Potsdam. For the population of Potsdam, sellers had to suffice. Bomber Command was not bombing rubble in Potsdam. Apart from an American day raid by 40 liberators on the 21st of June 1944, which damaged a few districts in the east of the city, Potsdam had avoided direct air attack until 1945. It was a relative haven during the Battle of Berlin in 1943-44, but its proximity to Berlin meant bombs had been dropped on Potsdam 50 times since June 1940. Potsdamers watched the raids on the capital. It was first thought this behaviour caused many to perish in April 1945, having not believed that the attack was directed against their city. Potsdam also had its own Bomber Command target code, Crayfish. Berlin was whitebait. Potsdam became a priority at the 17th meeting of the Anglo-American Combined Strategic Targets Committee 
on the 7th of February 1945. In addition to Berlin, Leipzig and Dresden, seven cities, including Potsdam, were selected as associated with the movement of evacuees and military forces behind the Eastern Front. So moving on to the attack itself, Potsdam was hardly bristling with air defences, but still felt the full force of bomber command. Spitfire reconnaissance images taken on the 9th of April were used in planning three days later. The Potsdam operation involved 500 Lancasters and 12 Mosquitoes of numbers 1, 3 and 8 groups. 491 aircraft attacked the city. It marked the first time that four-engined Bomber Command aircraft had penetrated Berlin's defence zone since March 1944. Nevertheless, no undue trouble was anticipated given the route across occupied Germany to within 60 miles of Potsdam. Railway facilities and barracks housing military and party personnel were targeted, with the domed Church of St Nicholas, 650 metres north of the railway facilities, as the reference point. That same night, as is shown on this slide, 28 Lancasters attacked naval installations and shipping at Cuxhaven on the North Sea, 76 Mosquitoes raided Berlin and Riesmar on the Baltic, and 112 aircraft were tasked with radar jamming and monitoring German night fighter stations. Altogether, on that night of the 14th of April, 724 aircraft were dispatched from the 25, from 25 airfields across the east of England. It was recognised central Potsdam suffered heavy damage, including the railway traffic centre where the locomotive depot, the goods station, passenger stations and the carriage and wagon shops were destroyed or heavily damaged. Military barracks suffered considerable damage. In addition, the plant and offices of the Arado Aircraft Components Work was also apparently heavily damaged. Two windows diversions and the Cuxhaven raid hoodwinked many of the remaining German night fighters, with Hamburg apparently viewed as a likely target. Few night fighters were seen near the actual target itself. At Potsdam, there was one attack and six combats. Along the 30 miles southwest of Potsdam, three combats occurred. Like flak was reported at Potsdam and Cuxhaven, with active ground defences encountered at Magdeburg, Brandenburg, Wittenberg and Dessau. Bomber command losses were low. At Potsdam, one Lancaster from one, number 138 squadron was shot down by German fighters. Six of its seven aircrew perished. Another Lancaster from 35 squadron experienced an engine fire close to the target of Potsdam. Six of the crew bailed out, one being killed, four fell into German captivity and one evaded. The pilot got the aircraft back into Dutch airspace and then bailed out himself. So essentially, the Potsdam operation cost uh, Bomber Command seven personnel. Just over 1,750 tonnes of bombs were dropped. 98% of these were high explosives. The remainder were incendiaries. Included in this were some 16 8,000 pound bombs and 383 4,000 pound bombs. The raid lasted 34 minutes, from 22.42 to 23.16 hours. Weather conditions were reportedly excellent, with no cloud and good visibility. A continuous concentration of markers were maintained around the aiming point, which the master bomber identified in the light of flares and on which, under his instructions, a heavy and accurate attack was delivered. Potsdam was shrouded by smoke. Numerous heavy explosions were observed. The glow of fires was reportedly seen over 100 miles away on the return journey. On the German defences, it was observed that numerous decoy markers were in operation, but were unsuccessful and did not attract bombing. However, there were apparently still numerous and accurate searchlights and many aircraft were coned in their beams. Slight to moderate heavy flak was reported, but largely burst below the bomber stream. Number One Group's operations book, record book noted that from the Rhine onwards, there was no cloud and in the target area, conditions were excellent with good visibility. Marking commenced punctually 
with red target indicators and illuminating flares. The early crews immediately identified the city's built-up area and the surrounding lakes. The master bomber, who was heard by most crews, issued concise, helpful instructions throughout, advising crews to ignore the white markers. He varied his instructions to bomb on whichever of the red or green markers visible seemed at the time most accurate. Preliminary examination of photographs on the return to stations confirmed the raid's success. Squadron operation record books highlighted good visibility and plentiful concentrated markers, leading to accurate concentrated bombing and many fires. Squadron accounts mentioned two favourable factors, good weather and minimal German opposition, both from the ground and in the air. As was said earlier, despite numerous searchlights coning individual aircraft, flak burst below the bombers and German fighters were a rare sight. Photographic intelligence units images taken on the 16th of April showed heavy, high explosive damage throughout central Potsdam. The railway traffic centre was severely damaged. The Arado Aircraft Component Works east of the railway centre was badly damaged. The Bomber Command Review for 1945 indicated that 13% of Potsdam's built-up target area was destroyed. 559 acres of the city was 40% or more built up and 75 acres of this was destroyed. So the, the bombing was concentrated in the uh, centre lower part here of, the, uh, of, this, of this map of Potsdam, down in the, 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 the town centre and the suburbs just to the, uh, just to the west of the River Havel. Brief British press reports said it was known that Nazi military and political departments had recently moved from Berlin to Potsdam. This explained the attack. A Swedish newspaper's Berlin correspondent reported the Potsdam operation had almost eliminated the town. The lack of warning time was already recognised by the air raid protection authorities in Potsdam because of the front's proximity. The sirens had howled in Potsdam over 130 times since January and of course did so again at 22.15 hours on this spring Saturday evening, when the bombers reached the Hanover Brunswick area. The first bombs fell 25 minutes later. German accounts note that in addition to the 1,593 killed, almost 1,000 city centre buildings were destroyed and 60,000 residents rendered homeless. The railway yards were engulfed by fire. An ammunition train exploded. Historic civic buildings fell victim to explosion and flames. Interestingly, the local historian Hans Werner Mihan asserted that the Church of St Nicholas, the Old Town Hall and the City Palace were little damaged. Greater damage followed later from Red Army artillery. So that is the uh, Stadtschluss in uh, Potsdam. The picture on the left is from 1959 and the newer picture there is from 2013 when it was rebuilt as the Brandenburg Land Tag. But the original Stadtschloss, as said up there, was uh, demolished by the GDR in 1960. So the condition of this symbolic city palace and the Potsdam Garrison Church later provided a pretext for the East Germans to pull both down. And here's the Garrison Church, famed from the day of Potsdam in 1933. That's it in uh, 1945. There's a picture there uh, of the shell in 1966, and it was uh, demolished by these Germans in 1968, but is now in the course of reconstruction. So to conclude, in a world transformed, the work of Bomber Command was no longer acclaimed but instead posed awkward questions. Post Dresden, Churchill's faith in strategic bombing and striking at German morale was shaken. It had fluctuated before, but was now fixed against the idea. For the RAF, for the first time in three years, attacking German morale was ostensibly off limits. Assisting the advancing Allied armies was positive, was paramount, sorry. Nevertheless, carrying out this task could result in similar results to strategic bombing with heavy civilian casualties. That was broadly the case with Potsdam. 
precision in 1945 from 20,000 feet was of a different order to today. The difference between strategic and tactical bombing was hazy. This paper argues that difficult as it seems 75 years later, the operation was justifiable on military grounds. Even in April 1945, there were targets in Potsdam whose incapacitation assisted the advancing Allied armies. First, the railway system. Secondly, the barracks across the city. And thirdly, governmental and administrative structures evacuated from Berlin and for the province and Gau of Brandenburg. With the aiming point being the city centre, targeting specifically the guards barracks and the railway infrastructure, this was not technically an area attack, but it resembled one. Moreover, we should not forget that others were also active. American attacks in April 1945 are often forgotten or obscured. One historian observing American bombing of the shrinking German area reached a climax. Historic Potsdam was devastated in April 1945. It suffered a similar fate to so many other German cities, reaping the whirlwind of a war which the German leadership had forced upon the RAF, Britain and Europe. For Bomber Command, the Potsdam Raid marked the end of an era. Thank you.